Welcome, everybody, to another edition of the Inside Indy Sports Podcast. I'm Tyler James, and I'm joined once again by the one and only Eric Hansen. Together, we cover Notre Dame football, recruiting, and more for InsideNDSports.com on the Rivals Network. The Blue Gold game is in the books, so the next look at Notre Dame football we will get will come in August. We have plenty to discuss about the spring game, what's next, and the upcoming NFL draft. Former Notre Dame quarterback Malik Zaire was in town last week, so we wanted to get his thoughts about the spring game. The invasion of former players on Notre Dame's campus last week and and much more. Malik's been a friend of the podcast going back to our pot of gold days. So we wanted to catch up with him once again. Malik, thanks for joining us. Man, thank you so much for having me, man. It's one of the best podcasts out there. Glad to even be a part of it, man. Thank you so much. We appreciate you, Malik. Uh, before we get into some of the things that happened on the field Saturday, I wanted to start with everything that sort of happened outside of the blue gold game. How did how did the experience of being on campus with so many former players sort of compare to your previous trips back to campus as a former player? It was just real refreshing, man, because this time when I went back, it felt like I was going back during the time where, you know, we were relevant, you know, as a fan, as a class, being a part of the fan base and seeing all your guys. It didn't feel like it was a trip that you schedule when you get old and you just want to show the family the campus and that you played there. So it felt like we had a reason to be there. We were welcome back. And, um, you know, it was a great weekend. A lot of fun things was taking place. Malik, did you um, did you get a chance to interact with recruits? And also, was there somebody from a former Notre Dame player that you maybe never met before that you got a chance to meet on this trip? Oh, man. Well, I've always been a Notre Dame historian on the players that have been through Notre Dame. So I was it was refreshing to see just all the guys. Like some of the guys from the 88 team was pretty cool to see uh, just as a team. And then to see the fast forward to all the current NFL players, which are my former teammates and stuff, which is pretty cool also. So to see that mix really was just a good feeling that the program uh, still has some great guys that, you know, that four for 40, that's where you really get to see it. And so seeing that for those guys really did a lot for me. Uh, motivating too, because they all came back in some clean suits and a lot of cool titles for their jobs. Uh, so it's inspiring to see like even the 30, 40 years past when you play uh, still a lot of relevance that you have to the school and, and as an individual as well. Uh, Malik, I'm, I'm curious. I, I, people have been like, Oh, why, why, why has this happened? Like why, one, why is Marcus Freeman recognized so quickly to how important this is? And then two, how, how did it become such an afterthought from Brian Kelly or during the Brian Kelly tenure? I'm curious what your perspective on that was. Do you feel like it became that way or is this maybe um, this is maybe just taking this in, uh, uh, to a greater importance than maybe it was under the previous regime? Well, I think, you know, anytime you're at a place for a long time, you kind of get complacent to where things are, especially if they're good and, it's like if it's broke, don't fix it. And and also, you know, you just uh, – when you're so one-track minded on something, you don't – it's about time. And if you're not willing to spend the time on embracing the other parts of the program because it may not particularly pertain to winning, I think uh, when you're getting to year seven, eight, nine, it's kind of hard to ask for. Now we want to bring everybody back. So I think doing it at a time where Marcus Freeman is young in his career – to get a, a foothold on the on the alumni players and just the fan base at an earlier stage, I think it would suit better for, you know, the, the later support in his career and in and, and times he may need it, but also showing that it's, it's bigger than just winning games for him, which I think plays into the fact of why we like this transition from the previous regime, even though it was a, a very consistent thing that we had to something more of a, a newer approach in a time where, you know, football is bigger than just, just yelling and screaming at guys and trying to get them to win. You got to be more of a, a total perspective guy. And, you know, on top of that, I think it plays into not wanting to be forgettable. I think there's, even though he's the winningest coach of all time in Notre Dame history, it was a forgettable uh, factor in that, you know, 10 years from now, somebody sees him on the street, they're not reverencing the winning gets head coach. There's many storylines and narratives about that. So I do think that this gives you more of a, he's one of us 
as a fan base, even though he's a newcomer, and it's something good for the fan base to feel confident about, especially when you're so good and consistent that you feel like you're only one game away. This is the stuff that plays into getting over that hump. I had a different question in mind, but what you just said changed what I want to ask you. Did the way Brian left change the way that you thought about him and his his era at Notre Dame? No, I mean, it's just it played into what we always know about him is that, you know, this guy is a is a great coach, but he's not a, a coach that, you know, you'll bring over and eat dinner with every day just because that's just not the type of boundaries that he has. You know, he's definitely more of the old school coach that, you know, you see at practice and then you don't see after that. So I do think that's just just the, the era that he was in. And how it's so much different now, especially how it plays into recruiting. You can't be like that. The mystique of, you know, not talking to the head coach and the respect that reverence to players is not the same as it is now where you almost have to show respect to the player yeah. <laughs> in reverse. So, uh, you know, it's just a part of the era of football and how it's changing. But, you know, it was, it was definitely something – uh, out, outside of emotions, it made sense. And knowing who he is, I'm not surprised that he made it because, you know, it's, it's a lot of expectation to win when they're not uh, – when the fire is not under your seat. Leek, I'm curious, from my perspective, it seems like a major part of it, not, not just obviously Marcus and Hunter Biven spending the time to reach out to these former players, but also Marcus sort of gives off this – personality that, hey, I want to get around this guy. I want to get to know Marcus Freeman. Do you think that that played an important role in guys wanting to get back to sort of get get, get a, sort of an introduction themselves to, to Marcus Freeman? Well, you know, first he's from Dayton. So anytime you get a Dayton guy <laughs> in a position like that, you know, you, you want to be around something that you know is going to elevate the program. And <laughs> his personality just fits that. I mean, I don't know if he watches all the good movies with Denzel or speeches from Obama, but he's giving the the words of encouragement that people want to be around. And it's just amazing to see uh, the rallying support. Once you just put a little effort back into the people that are supporting the program and how far it goes. So his ability to be able to maneuver in these spaces and seem comfortable as such an early uh, part of his, his coaching career, let alone just being a head coach at Notre Dame, I think it shows the maturity and, 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 how much reverence he has for the guys that he looked up to that coach him and how much, you know, if you're just a revisionist of history, if you do things, how successful coaches do before they can try to translate for you as well. Once you get in that position. Malik, I'm going to shift this to the blue gold game and in your time uh, watching practice as well. Uh, from a player's perspective, how real is the blue goal game. How, how real are those performances in context of what's been happening in spring and what's going to happen in the future? Well, I think anytime you get in front of the fans is real enough to where, why wouldn't you want to put your, your best foot forward? So I do evaluate, you know, anytime you get in front of the fans is a serious thing. Um, and I think the spring just in general, just, gives guys opportunity to work on your craft and learn the playbook a little bit deeper. But for the young guys to just get on there and display what you're bringing to the school that we can look forward to. And, you know, playing well in that game means a lot to me considering I felt like when I played well in that game, it gave me confidence and credit to at least be in position to uh, be at that number one spot heading in the fall. So um, I think as a player, a lot of guys will try to play it. It's not as serious, but it was most definitely as serious to the individual in terms of you don't want to get worse during that time because it's too much to make up. Um, you had a chance to see Drew, I think, on Thursday practice, and then you saw him in the blue gold game. Did did those two scenarios match up? And, and overall, what was your kind of impression of Drew Pine? Oh, man, it <sighs> – I was disappointed because I thought practice was better yeah. than obviously what he showed, but you know, it kind of fits why he was the third string guy last year. You know what I mean? I think there's just, 
certain things you just don't want. Can't just get over an off season, and so it takes a little bit of time for more guys than others. But we knew he was wasn't the Bryce Young of college football, like the the hottest thing going. So you know, expectations are a little high for me because I know we have a lot of talent, and that if he just doesn't give the ball away, we'll be all right. But he gave the ball away in the spring game, so it just makes it look worse on the the position that he's in considering we're depending on him to do everything the right way, even though he lacks in the explosive screen popping plays. Speaking of expectations, Malik, what, where are you at with what Tyler Buckner can present this office? I think, I think most of us believe he'll end up being the starting quarterback. What, what how confident are you in what he's going to be able to do for Notre Dame this season? And what are your, what are the areas you're, you're most interested in seeing how he's developing in? I think he has a chance, man. I would love to see him develop his touch on the football, uh, being able to be a deep threat. I think anytime you can take the pressure off of his ability, which right now is the best one to be able to run and extend plays with his legs, if he can take the pressure off of himself by doing that, he can probably stay healthy longer, but also be able to threaten the defense more because we're going to need that, even with the type of talent that we have running the football, which I think is going to be a huge part, if not a major part of the offense. He's got to be able to complete the, the balls first man to man, which is a lot to expect from a guy first year playing, being as young as he is. But that's just the position where Notre Dame is with their quarterbacks. Uh, when you had a guy like Jack Cone had those same expectations. I mean, he did a good job, but it wasn't good enough to get us to where we want to be. Before we ask you about some of the other players on the current team, I wanted to see if you had ever seen film of Dante Moore, how much you know about him. I know he wasn't one of the recruits that was there this weekend, but he's he has visited and there's a lot of buzz about him. Cur- curious um, what you've heard, what you've seen of him. Yeah, so I've watched a good amount of tape on Dante. I think uh, he's got a lot of, uh, when you watch his film, you see a lot of variety of different, things that you do from the quarterback pocket, as opposed to like a guy like CJ Carr, who I just recently was able to see, you just see a bunch of shotgun, Matt Ryan type of things. But I do think with Dante, you get an overall uh, sense of talent from under the center to in the shotgun. He can move around. He's got some fast feet in the pocket. Uh, You see some good technique thrown and it looks pretty natural. So you feel good about guys that kind of got a complete Uh, film skill set and then you add on top of that he's playing in a cold winter environment and to be able to do all three but also be able to play in the cold especially for a South Bend situation I think it suits better than a California kid you know doing the same type of things so I think he is the best prospect uh, for what we are looking for at the quarterback position just to elevate the competition in the room and to give us some some credit, I think, just in college football landscape, especially in recruiting, that we can nail a recruit that the Bamas and those guys want. Because, uh, you know, we're usually famous at getting guys that you never hear about. <laughs> but you weren't one of them. We had heard of you. <laughs> yeah. yeah, You for were sure. elite 11. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, I, I traveled the country following Malik around, out to Portland and out to, uh, out to his <laughs> high school. Uh, so uh, Malik was definitely on the radar. Uh, Malik, I want to ask you about a, a former quarterback, and that's Jack Cohn. What are your thoughts on him as a potential NFL quarterback? Do you think he is draft worthy? What, uh, what, how would you sort of look at his potential moving forward? Well, I think him going to Notre Dame definitely gave him all the, the credit. He, he probably should have probably needed to even be able to be on a draft board. Uh, I think he wouldn't be able to have the same – a claim if he didn't go to Notre Dame last year. So he's earned the right to be on the team and and float around and, and he'll be a guy that you'll see pop up in an NFC championship game because all three of the starters got hurt or and he pops in there and, you know, has 200 yards and then gets a Taylor Heideke type of deal the next year and then fizzle out like Kevin Cobb towards <laughs> the end. So he'll have a nice stint in the in the NFL as a as a guy drafted, undrafted, doesn't matter. He'll be in some room for a little while and then have a couple chances to pop out there. You know, he's 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 definitely earned it winning that many games at Notre Dame. 
Malik, something popped in my head again. I, I still want to ask you about some of the other guys on the team, but um, if I'm not mistaken, you had maybe three different quarterback coaches. You didn't have Tommy, but I think you had Chuck Martin and then maybe LaFleur and then Coach Sanford. Is that right? Yeah. Okay. So what what was that like having so many different voices during your career and how much – does the quarterback coach actually go into developing the quarterback versus let's say the offensive coordinator and the head coach? Well, there's definitely levels to all three guys. I think obviously you see Matt LaFleur would stand on his kind of a different level than the other two, but there's a lot of respect to coach Martin, who was wild, really committed to Notre Dame from a, a development standpoint. The guy's a really smart guy, uh, understanding scheme, understanding defenses so they all have their the things I like about them even Stanford so uh, I do think that the development starts with the quarterback coach slash offensive coordinator because it's kind of his personality on how he sees football and how we learn it in the quarterback room is important because that's how you know we express our way of you know finding wins and I think everybody's system is a little different I think with the floor if he stayed we probably would have a longer route of success. I think just particularly myself, I think I played the best under him, but you know, that's saying a lot. I mean, he's an NFL coach. That's coach Aaron Rodgers. So shoot, if I had him, if I had a chance in the league and had him, I'll probably have success too. So I think the guys that you follow in that quarterback room are the ones that more times than not lead you to having success on the field. And so uh, with LaFleur, I thought I had my best shot and my best results really started from him. Uh, I think Coach Martin, it was a lot of opportunity. I just didn't get a chance. But I do think the development comes from the quarterback coach and then the offensive coordinator because it's their personality that you're Im imposing on the field. Malik, when you uh, don't, oh, go ahead. Sorry, sorry for getting you off there. I, I wanted to talk about the wide receiver position. Um, someone, <laughs> a group that – goes a long way in helping the, the, the quarterbacks look good. How, what is your level of concern for Notre Dame's depth at that position going into this season? Well, I think it won't be too much of a factor considering I think we're going to run the heck out of the football like we should. Uh, I do think it also gives opportunities for those young guys to have bigger moments to, you know, a third down, we need a Deion Cosley or a JT to go in there and make a big grab. I think that'll boost their confidence more than just us being a, pass happy offense like the Fiesta Bowl. Uh, I think it'll give some uh, also some maturity to those guys as well because now you have to really be good and get open because when we need you, we need you. And I think uh, them not being available is not going to help their case of spreading the football around when we have such a talented running back room, especially seeing guys like Jadarian Price uh, doing his thing as, as a young guy. So uh, it's, if anything, it's, it's leadership that needs to be shown in that in that uh, that receiver room. I think the technique and the coaching is going to be there from Coach Stuckey, but Braden Lindsey, you got to lead that group, especially those young guys, and making them prepared and ready uh, for when their moment comes in the game. Malik, um, putting in Thursday's practice and the Blue Gold game together, who are some of the guys maybe on defense that impressed you? I just think the the linebackers in general, from the young to the, the older guys, because there's so many. Every time I walk around, I'm bumping into a linebacker at Notre Dame. So mm -hmm. I do think that those young guys are impressive just because we just seem a little bit more stout uh, in that second half of the of the defense. And I do like the what the young guys in the secondary. I mean, uh, <laughs> uh, the fact that we're able to have that a little more of an edge. I think having a defensive coach in Marcus Freeman gives us an edge anyway defensively, but it looks like we're playing with more of an aggressive nature on defense. And that's something that's positive because, you know, we looked at the Alabama and Georgia game last year in the championship, and that was nothing but physicality and, and a bunch of hard hitting. So I think we're developing traits like that on the defensive side of football. So even though the score wasn't what, most people would like to see when they go to a spring game. I think it told a lot about what we're building. Link, I understand you had some involvement with the Irish Players Club tailgate this this past weekend. 
I'm curious what, what your thoughts are on what that group has been able to do um, for the current Notre Dame players and uh, what that experience was like on Saturday. Man, just an opportunity to actually be a part of something that directly gets the players play because if you break it down, that's what it's all about, getting some money in the player's pocket. So being a community manager to help uh, stimulate and uh, engage with the group that's paying those bills that want the access and want those connectivity things with the, the players like never before. It's a great chance to be a part of that because it's new. So uh, seeing what works and doesn't work, but also uh, helping develop the players brands that can last even after Notre Dame and finding ways for them to make money uh, while at school, knowing how hard it was when I was there. Uh, it feels good because it's more than just doing a job. And following up on that, I got two follow-ups. One is, um, how did the fans seem to react to that? I mean, how did they receive that whole concept of being able to kind of mix with the players and mix with the alums? Well, a lot of it was is, is still a, a cool experience for them because they never had something like this before, but also understanding the, the benefits of what this can carry over as an investment. Right. Uh, down the line, I think, you know, Notre Dame people are generally pretty smart. And and the people I tell you are pretty smart people. I mean, the way they were understanding, some understood better than others about what it means in the future. But to out of the love of the fandom of being a Notre Dame fan, which got them in there first, I think they're just seeing the fruits of their labor as something that can be bigger than just what we did that weekend. But uh, the, the help in the program. I think this is a program extension of the program, not maybe directly involved, but an extension of the program that can be a safe way for their players to make money and not be caught up in the fanfare of what has become so far. But for the fans, I think for them, uh, they're going to want to be a part of this as it grows, which is strengthening the community too. My other follow-up is how much did the Anora whiskey help the um, tailgate? <laughs> yeah, the Anora whiskey, man, I'll tell you what, that's something that's going to get the party started and uh, get people talking and definitely having the good good times there. And I think uh, a lot of people caught on and hopefully we can continue to build that as well. Maybe not in direction with the players. We don't want to promote that until they get to be pros like LeBron or something. But uh, it is something that's also – uh, a unique product that I thought would be a great uh, community builder for all the smart people that are doing things now. I think it's just something a little different. And I'll say I ran into Malik um, on Thursday night before the blue gold game, and I got to sample some and it is really good whiskey. Um, and I'm not just saying that because he's on the podcast after he leaves, I will say the same thing <laughs> that it was, it was really, really smooth. I really enjoyed it. And, and for those people that don't understand your involvement in it, what's your involvement? I think Tavon's in it too, as somebody else from the team yeah, too. So, so Tavon and me right now uh, from the team are a part of it. Uh, we've been doing it for about almost four or five years and uh, it's, it's becoming something that uh, it's like our little golden egg and hopefully we can continue to build it the way it's supposed to and um, get it popping. I mean, that's, that's the goal. Malik, you are not a stranger to these podcast streets. You are doing the Lucky Lefty podcast. What else are you up to, and how can people keep in touch with what you're doing these days? Uh, just at Overtime Malik on all my social media. Malik's out here, eight on Twitter. Um, coaching a little bit with Justin Utubo at Lakewood. I'm the, I'm the quarterback coach, office coordinator. Uh, he's doing a great job building a program similar to Marcus Freeman, man, just turning around from where it was and – uh, then I'm also um, working with the Yoke team, uh, keep going with the Irish Players Club, having those people uh, buy the NFTs and stuff. So um, doing a little bit of everything, but still keeping the main focus about Irish football and, and, and hopefully uh, it all comes full circle. Okay. And just um, for people that want to, I think you mentioned to me that you can order the whiskey online. So what's the website for that? AnoraWhiskey.com uh, okay. should be in stock and will be in a store near you very soon. Uh, we're in Vegas right now for the draft. So fingers crossed, get into some hotels and then we can start throwing some events at the MGM. 
All right. We'll make sure we're invited next time. <laughs> Malik, we, we appreciate you uh, joining us on the podcast as always, and, and good luck with everything you're working on. Thanks so much, man. Thanks for having me, guys. It's the best podcast out there. All right. Now it's time for Place Your Bets. How much you want to make a bet I can throw a football over the mountains? This is our segment dedicated to the degenerates. Let's make some prop bets for this week's NFL draft. First one I have for us, Eric, is over under 10 and a half picks overall for Kyle Hamilton's draft selection. Well, you know, you either see him in the top 10 or you see him at number 11. So that's why you put this at 10 and a half with, with the Washington. What, what's their name now? That's not the Washington. The Commanders. The Commanders. The Commanders. The Washington Commanders. Um, I think the thought of Kyle Hamilton dropping out of the first round is not real. I think he will go in the top 10. I don't care what his 40 time was. I think you look at the film and you say, I want a player that's that unique and that smart and that versatile on my team. So I'm going under 10 and a half picks. Yeah, I'm going under as well. I, I feel like uh, it, it's, it's so fascinating to see how this is sort of developed and I, you never know how much of it is real or not how much it is right. just little smoke screens and people trying to get people off the kyle hamilton scent um but <laughs> i don't understand how what happened to jeremiah usu koromoa happened last year like i don't think he was i didn't think he'd be a top 10 pick but i thought he was definitely a first rounder and then he slid um and then he goes out and has a great, like a first rounder yeah and then he goes out and has a great season so i don't know if there's any carryover to that people are like hey what why were we second guessing jeremiah usu koromoa and why are we second guessing Kyle Hamilton? Now, I know every every recruit is their own individual, and it doesn't necessarily matter that they went to the same school. But I don't know. I just think people are overthinking the Kyle Hamilton thing. I understand the hesitation of, of, of hey, is it worth drafting a safety that high? But I do think he's just that good of a player. So I'm, I'm going to go under. Um, and if he doesn't go in the top ten, then I think some people are making mistakes. Next one, over under 123 and a half picks overall for Kyron Williams draft selection. Well, if I did my math right, that would be pretty late in the fourth round. About the uh, middle of the fourth round, right? So um, I'm going to say it's under that. I Again, Kyron um, ran really slow at the uh, combine, sped it up at the pro day. Um, and, and some of his other testing numbers were decent and just his production and his toughness. I, I just think once you get past some of the elite backs in the draft, you know, before Kyron ran the 40, I think a lot of people thought he was as high as RB number three. So I think he's definitely a guy that would go early part of the fourth round or maybe the late third. So that's, that's my prediction under. I'm going to go with over. I just think he, I think, and that's not a reflection of my belief in Kyron Williams. I think he can be a very successful uh, NFL running back. Um, but running backs are losing sort of their value in the draft. I think people want to invest lower round picks in running backs. So I'm curious how many running backs get drafted high in this draft. And that would certainly impact where Kyron Williams um, gets drafted. Uh, I do think people are probably overthinking it with Kyron Williams as well, but it's, it seems like from my recent experience of following the draft, it seems, guys seem to always go later than you would think they would go. And I think that's probably going to, uh, at least, I don't know if it probably happened, but my, I have a gut, my gut is telling me that's going to happen with Kyron Williams, whether or not it should or not. I think I probably disagree that he should go. I think he should go before the middle of the fourth round, but I'm not sure that that's going to happen. So I'm, I will predict over. Next question, who will be drafted first, Jack Cohn or Kevin Austin Jr.? Well, Jack Cohn has done a great job of getting him, making himself into a draftable prospect. Uh, but I think Kevin Austin, when people understand his history, and how little football he played for two years before last season, that they're going to look at a guy with incredible traits that best football is likely ahead of him. And I think that's why Kevin Austin gets drafted before Jack Cohn. 
Yeah, I, I tend to agree. I think Austin, there are there are maybe even more question marks about like what he can be than Jack Cohn. I think people probably have a pretty good sense of okay, this is what Jack Cohn is. Um, whereas Kevin Austin, it's like, oh man, I don't, I don't know. Like, is he is he as good as some of the athletic measurements would indicate that he could be, or is he a guy that's just not going to necessarily meet his potential and and uh, is is going to have a hard time getting there? And I think. I actually thought his pro day wasn't good because he did have a number of drops, um, which I think is probably one of the biggest things that he needs to prove about himself. So um, I, I, it wouldn't shock me if Jack Cohen went before him because of all those questions about Kevin Austin, but I do think Kevin Austin will, will be drafted earlier because it just, the, the, the potential there and what he could be is a little bit more alluring than I think what the, the, the ceiling is for Jack Cohen. Okay, now I want to add something here, too, because I wish I had remembered to ask Malik this. But when we were sitting having a Nora whiskey Thursday <laughs> night, um, he was really impressed with Chancey Stuckey. And he, he had some conversations with him. And he said that the receivers that were on the team now and, and Chancey both intimated that Chancey's doing a lot more coaching in terms of fundamentals and really the finer points of the game, the nuances of route running. And I think, um, you know, had, had Kevin Austin come back, he would have benefited from that. But sometimes when we've seen Chase Claypool and Miles Boykin run these crazy 40 times and say, why aren't they getting separation? It's, and I don't think Malik minds me sharing this, it's Malik's thought that fundamentally they weren't drilled down enough to to get the, that kind of separation. And that's something that he felt was happening in practice when he watched Chancey Stuckey. So I just wanted to throw that in there. All right, that's a good nugget. Um, we will not hold it against you for not asking Malik, <laughs> but <laughs> uh, you, you you got the you had the pre podcast before the podcast. So. That's right. We also <laughs> debated whether there was more talent on the 2015 team and the. 2020 team yeah that could probably be a podcast uh on its own um next prop that i have for us will myron tonga by Amosa get drafted well he was invited to the combine and that's always a good sign but when he participated in the combine and he didn't do poorly but you kind of saw what the comps were and people want the freaky edge rusher and not the solid versatile guy that can play inside and out. And I even talked to somebody um, that felt like maybe Myron from a pro standpoint would have been better off staying inside and uh, there were, there would be better comps for him as an inside player. So I'm guessing that Myron does not get drafted, but does get in a camp and does well. Yeah, I, I, I get that. I, I think I I would probably tend to agree that I think his potential as a defensive tackle three technique is probably higher than it, than it is as a defensive end in the NFL. Um, although I think probably showing some of the pass rush stuff that he did at, as a defensive end is, is a value to him, even if it's not going to be happening on the edge in, in the NFL. I'm, I'm curious where that goes. Um, and I think, I think it's, I think it, just from like sort of watching him, I think he is more naturally better at the lighter weight. I think I think that I think it suits his frame a little bit better. So I think being a defensive tackle is maybe harder on his body and not and not as easy for him to achieve. So that that's something that his pro destination will have to sort of work with him to figure out. So maybe um, thirty four is the scheme that fits him best. Yeah. So I, I, I'm going to say yes, just because I think there are some intriguing is some intriguing oh man I can't speak there is some intriguing potential there uh for for Myron uh so I, I will say he gets drafted but it would be a very very late pick um if he does and lastly which undrafted former Notre Dame player will have the longest career well we're looking at Drew White Isaiah Pryor possibly Kurt Heinish possibly Myron Kane Madden Jonathan Dore and possibly Jack Cohn. So since I went in the category of Myron not getting drafted, I'm going to say Myron. If I had to pick somebody else so that we have a chance to 
match the same answer? I would say Heinish. All right. My pick was Isaiah Pryor. Now, I know that might be a little bit surprising because he wasn't even a, a, really a starter at Notre Dame, but I, I think he's a very good special teams player, and I think there's a chance that he could really carve out a role for that, for him in that in the NFL. Um, maybe, I mean, I think the sort of like best case scenario for him is something like how Matthias Farley has carved out a, a pretty good living in the NFL as a special teams ace um, that, that was relied on at some points uh, as a defensive player, but he really made his money uh, as a special teams player. And I think Isaiah Pryor has a chance to do that. Um, so I, that would be my sort of gamble there that he can, he can turn that into something and stick around for a while um, with special teams as his uh, moneymaker. All right, now it's time for questions. You can submit questions to us on Twitter or on the Insider Lounge message board before every podcast. I'm at T James ND and Eric's at E Hansen ND. First one from the Insider Lounge is from Rockney 93. It sounds like Brian Kelly clearly had no interest in getting former Notre Dame football players involved with the program, but shouldn't Jack Swarbrick also be held accountable for allowing this type of behavior to occur? You know, Malik had a pretty good answer to this, and I'm going to add my two cents worth in that. I, I don't know that Brian was against having alums back. It just wasn't, didn't seem as a concerted, organized effort. And it certainly was an upgrade from what Charlie Weiss, I mean, Charlie Weiss wouldn't let former players into practice um, that wanted to come. So I remember there being an upgrade there. Uh, I think, again, Brian maybe didn't see the value of putting the effort into it, but I don't think if 300 players wanted to come back, he would have said, Oh no, that's way too many. Please, please don't. So in that light, your question has to do with Jack Swarbrick. I, I don't think that um, Jack Swarbrick is to blame there. I don't think that people weren't welcome back. I just think maybe they learned a valuable lesson about how important it is to embrace that. Um, and so, you know, he's not certainly not preventing Marcus from doing it. Right. Uh, I, I mean, I'd like to spend some more time talking to people to get a better understanding of how this sort of developed with this perception that Brian Kelly wasn't invested in getting former players back. I, I, I don't know. I wasn't, I didn't cover Notre Dame when he first came to, to Notre Dame. Uh, so I, I don't have the the previous knowledge of how, if he at first put a value on that, it seems pretty natural to do like, like Marcus Freeman isn't inventing the wheel here by saying, Hey, I'm the new coach. I want, I want all these former guys to come on campus and embrace both me and the current program. Um, but he's wisely done that and put people in charge to make sure that happens. Um, it's surprising to me that no one at Notre Dame sort of took that on during Brian Kelly's tenure. Now, is that should he have done that? Should Jack Swarbrick have done that? Or should someone else have stepped up and done that? I don't really know who, who to who to blame. I, I, I don't have enough insight to how that sort of played out to really say, hey, you, you need to have you should have done a better job here. I mean, to me, like Jack Swarbrick hired Brian Kelly to win games and he was doing that. So his methods of doing that. Um it, it didn't, it, it didn't necessarily have to include what, I mean, whatever Brian Kelly was doing was working. I know it wasn't working to the level of winning a national championship, but I, I, I it does, I mean, I would quit. Like my question now is like, well, if the, if the former players were more involved, would they have won a national championship while Brian Kelly was here? I, I don't, I don't know if that, that was like the missing ingredient to Notre Dame winning a national championship. Now maybe it will be, I don't know. I think uh, right now it's good it's a good move by Marcus Freeman. It is important. I think it is, but uh, we can't, I mean, I don't, we can't draw a direct correlation of whether or not this is going to help him win games next season or in the next three seasons. Um, I think it's an important thing for recruiting. Um, and that would have been something that should have been an easy thing for Brian Kelly to lean on because he, 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 does, he wasn't the same type of recruiter as Marcus Freeman. And so if you rely on some people that can speak to the school and what it's done for them, that would have been sort of a natural fit. And <laughs> I found it pretty interesting that uh, LSU had some former players on campus um, like Jamar Chase and Derek Stingley and Joe Burrow this past weekend for LSU spring game with Brian Kelly down there. So someone down there values that, whether that was Brian Kelly or someone 
in the LSU program that says, hey, this is how we do things here. So this needs to needs to be an important part. I don't know how that came about at LSU, and I don't really know how it sort of seemingly fell apart under Kelly at Notre Dame. Well, a couple of things that come to mind. One is, and when I talked to Malik about this on Thursday, um, you know, we were talking about 300 versus typically 20 players coming back. And he said, it's not that they hadn't been invited back before, but it was almost kind of like an afterthought. You know, it's like, hey, if you're coming back from for the blue gold game, here's where you get your tickets. He said that Hunter Bivens sent the invitation out three months prior and said, hey, look, we're going to have a networking meeting. We're going to have a golf tournament. You know, it was very structured. And Malik goes, wow, they're serious this time. And then the alums started talking to each other and it became an event. It was like, if you weren't there, what's your excuse? You know, and everybody was was pretty excited about going back. The, the other way that Brian Kelly tried to connect with the past was hiring former players. I mean, he did hire Audrey right. Denson and Todd Light and thought that would help recruiting. Ironically, it didn't as much as he, he had hoped to. Um, but he did see the value in the former players. I guess it just kind of looked different. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's a, it's everything is very convenient to blame Brian Kelly for right now. I mean, that's the easy way to, to point at things. Now, I, I'm sure there is there there definitely is some blame there, but it's not like Brian Kelly completely ignored the past at Notre Dame. I think sometimes things get skewed out of whack because people don't like the way things ended um, with Brian Kelly, and I, I think it's I mean. It is it is fascinating to see that there, there is this perspective that he didn't care about former players, but like you said, yeah, I mean, Autry Denson and, and Todd Light were on staff, um, and those hirings didn't necessarily. I mean, they, they weren't bad, but they weren't they weren't great. They weren't difference makers necessarily in the program either. So um, it, there's all kinds of different ways to 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 get the job done, and uh, we'll see if Marcus Freeman's way um, works out in the long run. Next question we have is from at Mike Devoy one. I didn't see the blue and gold game, but saw replays of Drew Pine's interceptions or decisions on his part. It also looked like he was getting a lot of pressure. Were there blocking issues on Saturday or did Drew Pine just not handle the pressure? Well, you know, I'll give you the context first. And then the answer, there was a lot of mixing and matching of the offensive line. So guys that typically aren't used to playing with each other because they drafted and then the flip side of that was, though, that after the first sack, maybe the second pressure, Marcus went up to the referees and said, let him play. So he didn't want sacks called for just touching them. You know, he wanted it to be really clear that it would have been a sack in a game. So um, the quarterbacks definitely had more time to play with. Having said all that, um, I thought Drew Pine struggled not because of the pressure. He was, I mean, he didn't handle the pressure well. He didn't handle wide open receivers well. This is inconsistent to what we had seen in our few practice windows. And as Malik mentioned earlier in the podcast, it was inconsistent to what Drew had shown in the Thursday practice, which is practice 14 before the blue gold game. So I think reality probably is in between what you saw in the blue gold game and maybe what we saw Drew Pine at his best in some of the practices. Yeah. And, and the format wasn't conducive for him to sort of reset either because he was playing for yeah. both teams. So you right. go mess up for one team and then you throw your, your play wristband to the sideline and then go to the other sideline and play for the other team. So he wasn't getting a lot of breaks in there, which I think that's where a lot of teaching moments can sort of happen. Um, in between series and, and sort of recognize the mistakes that you made. Although some of them, I, I don't know that, <laughs> I don't know that you needed a lot of review to know what happened there, but um, I, I don't think that that, that certainly probably didn't help the situation. Um, but, it, but I mean, it doesn't necessarily excuse his poor play either. I think he was getting pressured and it's hard for him to handle pressure at his size. Um, and Notre Dame has some pretty big defensive linemen that were getting their hands up and, and pressuring him as well. So um, I think, and the as we know, the defensive line depth is better than the offensive line depth. That was going to impact the quarterback. So I wouldn't say that the offensive lines played great, 
um, both as pass blockers and run blockers, but also uh, that's, and so I, and, and so we, and I don't feel too concerned about that because those are the, the, the starting five wasn't playing together, but um, Pine has to, Pine just has to make, to make better decisions and also be more accurate with the football. And he, he wasn't doing that on Saturday and that's gotta be a, a concern moving forward. Next question is from Rhino 1134 on the insider lounge with the Intel you have on the quarterback situation and the performance of pine in the spring game. Is there really a quarterback competition at this point, or is that just being said to keep pine engaged? I don't think it's being said to keep pine engaged. I think there was a commitment to, letting the 15 practices play out and then evaluating. And, um, you know, I, I expected going in that Tyler Buckner would win the job. I still expect Tyler Buckner to win the job. Um, and there's not a convenient time to publicly announce who the number one quarterback is until we get into fall camp. And that makes sense too. There's times where quarter mix, have tremendous growth during the summer then you get into fall camp and the team really sees who the number one quarterback is that's usually how it plays out except in Malik's case when it was a tie uh going into the Texas game in 2016 <laughs> and I don't want to get him started on that but uh uh yeah because he he didn't like he would have much rather been two than one a uh let me tell you but uh uh so I think in the summer, it's good that they both strive to be good quarterbacks, that they both take first team reps in the player only practices. Because again, Buckner's going to get hurt at some point, likely not seriously, where Pine would have to come in and play a stretch in the game and help you win a game. And I think it's really important that that go. But I mean, I think Drew Pine probably knows that Tyler Buckner is the number one quarterback at this point. Uh, what he needs to do is put himself in a position to help the team win. Yeah, I mean, to start, I don't think that that was necessarily a reflection of how Drew Pine played all spring. I think it was more of an outlier. Um, but I do think that Buckner had been ahead of him um, and seemed to be the option that was going to get the job. Um, that's why we were all so disappointed when, when he – sprained his ankle and wasn't able to play in the game. Um, I, I think the competition was always there to push Tyler Buckner, um, but it was going to take a poor spring from Buckner um, for Pine to, to jump past him. Um, keeping Pine engaged is certainly important, as Rhino asked, but I, I think he's, he's going to be engaged about Notre Dame football because, I mean, he genuinely loves it. I mean, listening to Drew Pine talk about Notre Dame football, and he, he even spoke about, like, Marcus Freeman – and his confidence is him as head coach. He's like, I like Marcus Freeman as a coach, but I also like him as a Notre Dame football fan. I think he's the right guy for this program. Um, so I, I thought that was that was kind of a neat perspective to hear from Drew Pine that he, I mean, th this Notre Dame football really matters to him. Um, but I mean, in the age of, of the portal, all quarterbacks are going to be in a competition because they need to all have a chance to to be able to play. I mean, unless you're unless you're a bona fide returning starter, I think springs across the country are having quarterback competitions. Um, so this isn't necessarily unique to, to, to Notre Dame. Uh, I, I think the way it has played out is probably how we expected it, but that doesn't take away from like the seriousness and the, the fair chance that Drew Pine was being given in the spring either. Next question is from Marie, Bia, Marie Biafore at Biafore underscore Marie. Are you at all concerned about Pine's play in the blue gold game, or would you chalk it up to a bad day? If the way he played is representative of how he played all spring, do you think Notre Dame should pursue a quarterback in the transfer portal? I hope it was just a bad day. I, I think it was more a bad day than consistent with what uh, the coaches saw from Drew Pine. I know in the um, the scrimmage a couple weeks ago, a couple weeks before the blue gold game, Tommy Reese professed not to know who threw the late interception uh, that that gave the defense a chance to win that game. Um, and it was Drew Pine from one of our sources. But, um, you know, when we saw him in the open practice, he looked pretty good. You know, Buckner looked like number one, but Drew Pine looked pretty good. And just 
in the drills where there's not a lot of competitiveness, where there's not defense a lot of the time, you know, he looked fundamentally sound. I mean, the one thing about Drew Pine is, you know, the guy's working his butt off to get better. And um, I, I admire that in him because a lot of people like me have been writing him off for a long time and he just uh, rises above that. So as far as the transfer portal thing, I mean, if you were to go to the transfer portal at this point, theoretically you would be looking for quarterback number two, not quarterback number three. And then if Drew Pine knows you're going to do that, is he going to want to stick around? And are you really better off getting that transfer quarterback with him having to learn the offense this summer and in fall camp where maybe he's not getting number one reps or just investing in Drew Pine being your backup? So um, I think that's kind of the scenarios that you're looking at there. Yeah, I, I, I touched on it sort of pre in, my, in the previous question, but yeah, to me, I think it was more of a bad day than a concern. I think it, the concerning part is that it, it, it's kind of troubling to see what the bad side of Drew Pine looks like. If that's, I mean, he, in my opinion, he can't afford to make mistakes because I don't think he's necessarily going to go out there and win you a game. He needs to be more of a steady presence as a backup quarterback. Um, and that's not how he presented himself um, on Saturday. So if he was like that all spring, I think you could consider a transfer portal quarterback, but I mean, you got to know that you're for sure getting a better option than, than Drew Pine and, and the, the importance that he has um, and the advantages that he has um, as someone has been in, in the offense and worked with Tommy Reese and has, has the relationship in the quarterback room that he does. Uh, we're going quarterback heavy here to start, but I thought there were some interesting questions. Uh, this one, it comes from at Buster Biven. Do you think Notre Dame would take a transfer quarterback if the head coach was in year three and needed a big year for job security? I think uh, I think it's possible that they would, but not at this juncture. I think if if they were going to consider that, they would have done it in January. Um, if they weren't unsure about what they were going to get out of Tyler Buckner, then – they would have looked at JT Daniels and uh, and been more serious about that and some of the other guys, the elite guys that were in the transfer portal. I realize JT isn't going to actually um, be enrolling at West Virginia until June, but he was in there and, and they could have lined him up. Um, and, and then they could have gotten other guys that were pretty good that would have been able to go through spring practice and compete for the starting job. So, I think that's the scenario, but again, I don't think Notre Dame is going to do that at this point, first year or third year uh, quarterback. The other thing that's kind of weird about doing that, let's say it was the third year, but you still have all the same people on your team, the same personnel. What are you saying to Dante Moore and some of the guys in the 2024 class that you had to go to the portal for two years in a row uh, for your number one quarterback. And I don't think that sends a great signal about player development. Yeah, no, I think there's something to that. And I, I think the, the, this hypothetical is fascinating to me. I think, it, I think it's a fair question and, and something worth pondering. And I think Notre Dame even was in a position that, I mean, it could have very well gone after JT Daniels or, or Keaton Slovis or, um, maybe even a guy like Paul Tyson, who was transferring out of Alabama, um, who I believe is at Arizona State, if I've remembered all the quarterback shuffling uh, correctly. But I, I think I think the decision to not take a transfer quarterback was more related to the internal confidence in Tyler Bucker being a difference maker at quarterback than it was like, hey, this is just year one. We don't have to win right now because I don't think Marcus Freeman approaches uh, – football in that way. <laughs> um, I think he wants to go out and win right away. I don't think he's trying to ease into this um, as a, as a head coach. Um, and I don't think, I don't think Tommy Reese necessarily approaches that approaches football that way either. Um, he welcomes competition. Um, he wants his position to be, to be the best it can be. Um, so, I mean, I, Tommy Reese was around when, when they pulled the trigger on replacing Brandon Winbush um, with, uh, with Ian book. So he, I, I don't, I don't think he is a gun sh gun shy person when it comes to making the, the decisions that put Notre Dame in a best 
in the best position to win. Um, so I, I think that's what they what they feel about Tyler Buckner. Now I know <laughs> it's it's sort of we're, we're we're sort of operating a lot on blind faith right now with not seeing him in the blue gold game and seeing one full practice this spring. Um, and the, the looks we saw at him last season and, and not necessarily a, a full um, full offense. So I uh, I know I know it's, it's sort of nerve wracking to sort of go through this and say, well, what are we, what are we going to see here? But um, there that that belief is there in Tyler Buckner. It's not like, oh, what do we have here? I, I don't think that's the way that that the Notre Dame coaching staff feels about Tyler Buckner, even if they're not coming out and say, this is QB one, because that, like we mentioned previously, that's not necessarily the best way to approach thing for the health of your quarterback room. Next question is from at Flanner Jim Saturday's game will, or Saturday's game felt like a nice moment in the spotlight for offensive walk-ons with hardly any resemblance of what we'll see in the fall. What is more likely breaking Kelly's record for worst offense or best offense at Notre Dame in points per game? Well, the worst um, when we go by ranking among the um, FBS teams was the year they got to the national championship game. 2012, they were 78th. Their best was 2019, and they were 13th. Um, I would say, and just to, that 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 matches the actual points per game because I did look at, I looked it up by points per game. They averaged 25.8 in 2012 and 36.8 in 2019. So those, those were the low and high points uh, as an uh, individual of how they ranked uh, against the, country, the country's competition as well. Right. But the, also that's kind of ironic is it very much correlates to the passing efficiency numbers. The best pass efficiency was Ian Book, under, in the Brian Kelly era, was Ian Book in 2019. And the worst was Everett Golson in uh 2012 they were i believe 74th as a team um and so my expectation is that notre dame is going to have a decent pass efficiency rating with tyler buckner as the quarterback so i'm going to certainly not say that they will be 13th in scoring but i would lean much more toward the 13th than i would the 78th number in terms of where they would stand at the end of the season. Yeah, I mean, this this was a harder question for me than I thought it was going to be. Um, to, just based on the numbers, I, I could see Notre Dame coming in around 30 points per game, and that would technically be closer to the fewest points per game rather than the most points per game. So I guess that's the way I would side that they'd have a better chance at fewer points. Um, but but I, I don't know. I think I think – <laughs> that they that's play what, some bad bad defenses this year but they play some elite defenses too correct correct that's the hardest part to sort of figure out is like okay well how how good will this team of being team be at taking advantage of uh the bad defense that it plays against um because that that can play a significant factor in in your points per game for the season so that that's maybe what's so interesting to me about this upcoming season i think there's a very wide variance of what this offense can be um and I'm not exactly sure what that's going to be. I, I, I don't know that I – I think I was probably more optimistic about the offense going into the spring than I am now, but I don't know that that's – maybe that's just because of a lack of being able to see Tyler Buckner in the blue goal game. I don't know if that's an overreaction or not. I, 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 don't, I feel like I don't have a good pulse of what this offense is going to be. Um, and so that doesn't necessarily mean it won't be good. Um, that might just be sort of – Notre Dame sort of <laughs> trying to keep Ohio State guessing as much as, as we're sort of guessing right now, too. So um, I would lean towards – I mean, I don't think either is likely. I don't think they're going to be the worst or the best uh, as, com as compared to Brian Kelly's track record for points per game. But um, I, I'll, I'll slightly lean towards worst rather than best right now. Next question is from at Steve Go Forth 5. I understand it's not easy to bring in undergraduate transfers with no degree. But what do you? But what areas do you see them needing to bring in a transfer to? Also, who do you think the starting five offensive line would be right now? Well, I still think from a grad transfer, if you could bring in two, I would bring in wide receiver, wide receiver, and I think that um, you know if Tobias Merriweather is able to get off to a great start, he arrives in June. 
if um, Joe Wilkins and Avery Davis come back healthy and stay healthy and Braden Lindsay stays healthy. But those things haven't intersected very often at this point. Um, and so I, that, that's where I would load up. If you had to load up at somebody at another position, I would still consider cornerback and I'd want somebody that could challenge for a starting position. If you're going to do that, that somebody that's going to challenge Clarence Lewis, even though I think Clarence had a good spring um, because you're one injury away from Jaden Mickey having to play. And I think Jaden's ready to do some of that. Um, but you're, you're awfully thin. I thought, I thought some of the other corners show out, but again, think about, who you have to go against in big games and Ohio state's receivers are who you're going against the team that scored almost 50 points a game last year, the number one scoring team in the country. Uh, so uh, those, those would be the positions that I would consider. And, you know, I know that somebody that's on Notre Dame's radar is UCF receiver Jalen Robinson. He's technically a red shirt junior. So I believe he's going to have his UCF degree and be able to be a grad transfer technically and maybe have a couple of years at wherever school he's going. I think he visited Ole Miss this last week, and he's a smaller guy, 5'9", 180, but really productive, so it'll be interesting to keep an eye on him. Yeah, I think if, you, if you're looking in the transfer portal, wide receiver is priority one and probably priority number two. I, cornerback is also the, the spot that, that, like you mentioned, I'm not exactly sure if I think it's more pressing or less pressing than, than I than I thought it was going into the spring. I mean, I think uh, Clarence Lewis had a decent spring. Tariq Bracey probably had a better spring um, or the best spring he's had as, as an Notre Dame football player. Um, so that I think that helps. Um, and certainly like what Jaden Mickey's done. I, I don't know if I've seen enough from Ryan Barnes or Philip Riley to say, OK, those guys are guys you can count on in the fall. Um, and that was, those were two guys. Barnes that I really, can hit. I don't I just don't know if we can cover. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. Barnes, Barnes was laying, laying the wood a little bit on Saturday. So um, I, so I, I think those are the things you're looking at. Um, and uh, a lot of it depends on who you can get too. I mean, if, if I, I think at receiver, you sort of have to take someone, I don't, you know what I mean? I don't, I don't it, it seems unrealistic to me that they just wouldn't, will not get a receiver at all based on how things have played out. Um, I think one of the encouraging things is it seems like Avery Davis is on track to be ready by the time the season starts. I mean, he was out there in pads before the game on Saturday, running around doing some things. Um, I, he's certainly not ready to play in full contact situations, but he seems to have been really uh, making good progress uh, in his recovery from the knee injury late in last season. So I think there was some questions of where he would be, but he seems to be, on track with uh, getting back and, and ready to help Notre Dame right away next season. So hopefully that continues that way. And certainly Notre Dame would have a better sense of how, how comfortable they feel with that. Um, but even in that, I mean, if that, 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 I don't think that that can be the, the difference maker and you deciding to, to add one, maybe that's the difference maker and you deciding to add two receivers um, because I, the need just is there. And I think that they have, they have to sort of address that. I mean, um, obviously you can't make you can't make wide receivers out of thin air there's got to be a match there but um, it feels like someone has to come in to help the depth chart um, this fall and then we had a second part of the question he wanted to know the starting offensive line yes I don't know why it wouldn't be the guys that are the ones right now uh, that would be Blake Fisher uh, then Josh Lug at right guard Jarrett Patterson moving back into the starting lineup when he's healthy, then at right tackle, Andrew Kristoffic, and then right guard or left left guard, Andrew Kristoffic, and left tackle, Joe Alt. Easy for me to say. Um, <laughs> I think probably Kristoffic is the most vulnerable to be overtaken by someone. I think the challengers at guard would be Rocco Spindler, Billy Shrouth, and don't laugh because I think he's going to be really, really good. Uh, he he would have been challenging this spring had he had a healthy foot. And then Zeke Carell. I, 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 the thing about Zeke is, you know, I'm not sure if the great work we saw at him from center this spring translates to guard because it didn't last year. So 
that's my answer. Yeah, and that, and that sort of gets into – I agree with you with, with, at the, with the starting five, and so I'll, I'll I'll get to our next question, which is specifically about Zeke Carell from at Buster. And do you think Zeke Carell at center is one of Notre Dame's five best offensive linemen? And I'll, I'll, I'll start by saying I don't think so. I, I can still be convinced of that, but I still think Kristoffik and Lug at guards are better than Carell at center. Um, and, and so, I, I mean, I, I guess – I mean, in this scenario, you're you're playing Jarrett Patterson at guard as well, and I, I'm not as 100 percent sold on okay, Jarrett Patterson at guard makes w- would work out, but maybe it would. I don't know. I mean, uh, I think his best Probably position, even the best center in the country. Yeah, I, I think it makes sense to. And I, I asked Zeke Carell about this. I was like, hey, like certainly you are tackling the opportunity that you're given right now at center, but like, do you look at this spring and say, hey? can I be a better center than Jared Patterson or can what I do this spring earn me a chance to, to be a starting guard? Um, he's like, I don't know. I'm just going out and doing what, what I can do. And I think that's the best he could do with that. Um, and so I, I think he, Zeke Carell did have a good spring um, as I would have expected. I think he is a, is a solid center um, and that his, is his best position. Um, but I'm not necessarily sold yet that he's his, him playing his best position is better than moving uh Jarrett Patterson to a different position to, to increase Notre Dame's uh, or change Notre Dame's starting five. Next question is from Nathan Reynolds at Enforcers 2117. Will Notre Dame be looking to bring in another field goal kicker? Well, they are in Zach Yoakum, who's a, who will be a freshman walk-on coming in in June from Upper Arlington, Ohio. Um, I, I don't, think that they're going to invest in another scholarship kicker. I mean, they could maybe go after another walk-on. Here's the thing about spring, and and I think the struggles were real, but also it's not um, rare that we see um, a kicker struggle in the spring or two and then go work with their kicking coaches, their private kicking coaches in the summer, and come back with all kinds of confidence and um, ability. So I think between those two and Zach Yoakum, they should find a combination that works for them without having to go into the portal and maybe, you know, investing in a scholarship, a third scholarship kicker, which would seem to be excessive to me. Yeah. Brian Mason certainly isn't afraid of adding competition at this in the specialist group, but that would seem to be pretty extreme to bring in a third kicker. Um, and I, <laughs> I don't know. I don't know what the kicker market looks like. Is there someone that is better that's out there? You would think if there was someone that good that they'd already be scooped up. Um, so uh, I would I would probably I would lean towards no on that, um, and, and focus on making sure either Blake Groupie or Josh Bryan are in a better position to execute um, when it comes to uh, kicking in games uh, this fall. Next question is from at Jeff ND fan over under of three and a half. What are you betting on for number of transfers out this week? I'll go under. I I don't think it'll be zero. I think it'll be a handful, and it'll be a small handful. So I'll say under three and a half. A, a baby sized handful. <laughs> a baby sized handful. Half a, a couple of fingers full. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I I would go under two. I think there there will certainly be some. Four seems a little high. Um, but, uh, but but maybe maybe it pans out that way. But I I, I would I, in this day and age I wouldn't be surprised by anything in terms of numbers of transfers. But four four would seem like quite a lot because there are a lot of even though there are the, the coaching changes have happened and people have sort of get a good read on what uh, what their situation is. I think that the sort of the positive um, momentum in, in the program. Um, and I think there's a real sort of cohesiveness to this team. So I don't expect there to be like a mass exodus this, uh, this, this week because they need to get in before May 1st to uh, be able to play next season. Right. And we should point out that they are doing exit interviews with the coaching staff this week. So they will get a better feel for what the coaching staff feels their future is like. All right. Next question is from at S- or SJB75 from the Insider Lounge. Six more days in the month. Are there any 2023 verbal commitments that are possible over the next six days? 
and uh, I'll take I'll take the lead on the recruiting okay. front. I, I I was gonna say yes, and I could see multiple ones, but we'll see. Yeah, yeah, I think uh, That's all your thunder. Defensive line is is what we're watching right now with Bubakar Treor visiting. I still am not 100 percent certain. Uh, that's how you say his name. I, I want to get him on the phone to to ask him, but I haven't been able to do that yet. Uh, I, I was also previously told to expect another commitment before the end of the month, and that was not Bubakar Treor. So um, I haven't nail, been able to nail down if that timeline still remains true. There hasn't been anyone else that has publicly acknowledged planning to make a a decision before the end of the month, but I still think there is a chance that that could happen. So yeah, I, I would say that there is a good chance that Notre Dame adds at least one more commitment before the end of the month. And we'll see if that happens, but I think Notre Dame is certainly in a very good position with a number of recruits, um, especially ones that visited this past weekend. Um, so uh, a lot of good positive recruiting momentum going for Notre Dame and just added their first offensive line commitment from Sam Pendleton on Monday. Next and first 2024 commitment over the weekend for anyone who was under a rock, Brandon Davis Swain, a defensive lineman out of Michigan, committed to Notre Dame as well. Uh, next question is from Sheldon66 on the Insider Lounge. Is Notre Dame recruiting any high school football players from Hawaii this year? Well, as far as 2024s, I don't remember seeing any uh, uh, Hawaii kids in the pot of gold. And in terms of the 2023, I can't think of somebody that's popped up that's been high on their uh, priority boards. And I think there's a reason for it. I think the Hawaii kids uh, in those two classes are a little bit underexposed from, from this standpoint. First of all, they didn't really have a 2020 season. They punted to spring and then they really didn't have a season in Hawaii in 2020. They didn't have a state tournament. And then in 2021, you know, there were some schools like Kahuku that won the Open State Championship that got in 10 games, but like Punahou, which is um, Marist's uh, Leofau, Marist Leofau's alma mater, they only got in five games. So again, you didn't get a great, a lot of high, great high school film. Those kids didn't get out to camps too often on the mainland. People on the mainland didn't get out to see them because of COVID. So I think, you know, there's not a top 250 player in the 2023 class from Hawaii, which is really unusual. So again, I, I think Notre Dame, like a lot of other schools, kind of passed on having to make the heavy investment to see these under recruited kids. And I think Notre Dame will be back to Hawaii at some point, but I just the cycle wasn't, wasn't realistic. Yeah. There, there actually is one offensive oh lineman uh, that's uh, just outside the rivals 100. I oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Lolu um, is the one that I've, I found, but Notre Dame has not offered him. Um, there's yeah. a four star, there's a four star linebacker. That's not in the two fifty. Uh, Leona leaf um, although I, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing any of those names correctly. Um, and that's not spelled the same as Maris. So it's not his brother. Um, but, uh, you are right. Like there are, there aren't a lot of highly ranked recruits in that area. And I think you probably hit the nail on the head in terms of why that is. Um, and so Notre Dame hasn't put out any offers there. Um, and, uh, and in the 2023 classes or any of the future classes to date. Um, so, um, I think there's probably going to be some underrated guys that end up having good careers out of Hawaii in these, these classes because of the reasons you mentioned. Um, I'm also curious to see how Notre Dame does with Hawaii without an, uh, with a new regime that doesn't necessarily have the same ties to the state at, at, that Brian Pullian did. Um, I think Brian Pullian would probably have more insight from not even, even though he hasn't been able to go out there and, and some of the restrictions that you've talked about, but I think, that's where those sort of ties really come into play where people might not know that this kid is as good as um, he is because uh, you have some good people that you really trust um, yeah. from, from being in touch with over the years. And so um, <laughs> my and, advice, and conversely, to, they trusted him, you know, they confided in him. They yeah, don't absolutely. trust everybody that comes out there. Absolutely. Uh, so my advice would all, I, although I guess I'm, I'm, I'm not sure that LSU is going to be relying on Hawaii a lot for recruiting, but um, if Brian, Brian Pullen, Kelly can't get there in his Tesla, 
<laughs> if LSU offers some Hawaiian kids, I would certainly uh, make sure that they are on my radar uh, because because of that. Um, so I think uh, um, that's sort of where things stand with Hawaii recruiting as of right now. All right, last question is from at RyeChand12. Who's going to announce the games on NBC this year? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it's funny. I, I emailed the NBC folks the other day um, and they said, well, you know what? We're not ready to announce our announcing team yet. So uh, I, I guess Mike Tirico could handle the extra duties. I don't think it's probably realistic. Um, and if they were going to promote, I guess Paul Burmeister would make sense uh, being the radio voice and elevating him to TV and having him work with um, Drew Brees. Um, but we'll see. Um, I don't have insight into that. Yeah, um, and there's been some reports that Drew Brees might not even be staying with NBC. Uh, so I think there's a chance that both of those seats could be open. Um, I, I sort of agree with you that Paul Burmeister, who does radio play-by-play -play for Notre Dame, will get serious consideration for the TV play-by-play. -play. I think he does a pretty good job. Um, I don't really have a good guess for the analyst role. So um, if you're interested, send in your application now. <laughs> it's very, very unclear what they're doing. I, I have to imagine there's some sort of plan, but a lot of the, the media, a, a lot of this stuff seems, tends to break from behind the scenes. I think uh, the New York Post, I believe that's where Andrew Marchand works. He does a lot of, behind the scenes reporting and gets a lot of scoops of where guys are going um, from the, the sports broadcasting point of view. So my, my, I'm guessing we'll find out from through other reporting before NBC announces it, but um, there hasn't been any real clear indication of where that's going. I think that in part is due to what all the shakeup that's happening on the NFL level. So the, the college level stuff um, is sort of doesn't get taken care of until all that sort of sorts itself out. All right, that's it for today's episode of the Inside Indie Sports Podcast. If you don't already, you can subscribe to us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, and other popular podcast platforms. If you like what you hear, give us a star rating, leave a review, and share our podcast feed with a friend. We'll be back next week with another podcast to review the NFL draft and likely weigh in on some transfer, transfer portal activity. But until then, stick with InsideIndieSports.com for all your Notre Dame coverage needs. Mm -hmm.